All right, today, the OG, the OG, I, we got one of the OGs in the house today, Javi, you're going to have to help me out today, all right, the OG, you, don't worry, you're safe, <laughs> I'm like a, a Sutherland OG, okay, I'm not dangerous, well, is that true, I'm dangerous to the devil, because I got the gospel. The OG. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, God, just be in this service, Lord God. Speak through me, Father. Let it be known what you want to be known, Lord God. Use me, Father, and move in this congregation. Move as a mighty wind throughout each person that's here, Lord God. Convict us, Father. Draw us closer to you. Break chains off of us, Lord God. Make us all mighty warriors for you, Lord God. We desire to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I chose the uh, hand mic because it looks a little more gangster. All right, it's just a little, little tougher. Don't worry, this is all going to make sense. I'm not trying to recruit you into a gang. Wrong, okay. I, I am, but it's a nice gang. It's God's gang, okay. My wife likes to buy flavored stuff okay so you know they got triscuits how many of you like triscuits i like triscuits you like them plain oh some of you don't some of you like them flavored okay i just like them plain i'm okay with like the sea salt olive oil one that's pretty good um i like pretty much like regular chips regular triscuits but jolene likes to try, like, try these flavors so she'll come back, and I'll be like, yes, Triscuits. And then she'll be like, well, they have this new flavor. I want to try it, at, you know, Diablo Fire. So I'm like, Man, I just want regular Triscuits. <laughs> Can you just get the regular ones? Or she'll get, you know, like uh, some crackers, uh, some, um, uh, you know, macaroni and cheese. What do we have? Cheeto flavored. Come on. I'll try it, and I'm always disappointed. I don't want to eat Cheeto flavored macaroni and cheese. I mean, Kraft got it, you know, they got it figured out. If I mean, this is not, you know, gourmet food, but you know, the Kraft box, pour it in there and boil water. How long do you cook them? 7.5 minutes. Dump in that delicious chemical powder soup, you know, and stir it up. A little splash of milk, not too much. A little slab of butter in there. If you're like me, it's butter. If you're not, you know, maybe you're trying to be healthy. I am too, but it's that's the stuff, right? We don't need Cheeto flavor craft macaroni and cheese. Just give me the original stuff. The original is the best. Sometimes the original is the best. We'll talk to you about uh, Coca Cola. I'm going to tell you a story. So, the story of Coca Cola Coca Cola was invented in 19. In 1886, by a Confederate colonel. His name was John Pemberton. And this guy had been wounded in the war, in the Civil War. And he became addicted to morphine. Because back then, if you got injured bad, they was like, ah, psh, shoot you with some morphine. So opiate addiction is nothing new. It's going on forever. So... He invented Coca-Cola, actually, as a substitute for morphine. Pemberton was then bought out by a guy named uh, Asa Gross Chandler, and he helped to market Coke worldwide. So he's the one who actually turned this into a worldwide brand. Some of you are old enough to remember what they call the, uh, the Cola Wars. 
you know, so Coca-Cola against Diet Pepsi. I was pretty young, so this is kind of going on in the 80s. Um, but they were just like battling for supremacy. Market share. They wanted market share. So it was Coke against Pepsi. And, you know, each of these brands has multiple drinks and flavors. And um, Coke, Coke had the, they had the brand. I mean, they, they had the market because everybody knew Coca-Cola. But after 100 years, after Coca-Cola was invented, after John Pemberton came up with the classic formula of Coca-Cola and invented it, 100 years later, the Coca-Cola company decided to replace the original formula in 1985 and launched New Coke. You remember, some of you remember. This was the what known as one of the biggest marketing disasters in history. I actually went to business school, gra graduate school, studied an MBA, and this case is used as a case study. When you go to business school, they give you case studies of things that went good and things that went wrong. Marketing, uh, running businesses, uh, you do these case studies. Coca-Cola, New Coke was a classic case study because it was such a huge flop. There's something going on right now that, that is similar with, uh, with Bud Light. Big mistake. Big mistake. And that's, I'm just talking about the marketing, the marketing side of, of from, the, from the, you know, the corporate side. Huge mistake. So Coca-Cola did this. They, they, invent, they, they came out with new, new Coke. But the public rejected new Coke. They said, no way. <laughs> How dare you? So you know what's funny is they, before they did this, they did some taste tests. So they would have uh, people come into a room, they have these, these market studies, and they'll, they'll have these people come in and they, they do a taste test and it's like, which do you prefer? And the people actually preferred at the time, uh, from, from what I understand, I'm not a big Coke or Pepsi drinker, but Pepsi was l a little bit sweeter. So some of the people preferred a little bit of a sweeter taste of Pepsi. And they did these studies and they found that the, the, in, they do this study, market study, and these people be sitting there and they would taste this and they'd be like, which one do you prefer? And they would give them um, original Coke and they would give them the new Coke formula. And the people would be like, oh, I like this one. And they'd be like, oh, well, that's, that is uh, new Coke. That's not Coca-Cola, that's, that's new Coke. And then the people would get angry. They would be like, what, you tricked me? I thought this was Coke. And they would get mad. The marketing team missed this little piece of information. So they said, well, people, people choose it, they like it, but they missed the part where the people felt like they got tricked by drinking, by finding out, wait a second, this is new Coke, this is not original, I'm mad now. So they went ahead and rolled out new Coke. And uh, you know, as sometimes as companies do, they say, hey, we're, we are who we are and we're just gonna do it and you're just gonna go along with it. There's a lot of resistance. The, uh, the, the packagers, you know, the, the, the uh, canning companies, those are individual companies, so they kind of get the syrup and then they, they package it up and the Coca-Cola supplies them with all the cans, so they, they let them run out of their original, you know, their Coke cans, and then they had to start doing their new Coke, and they were resistant. Well, it kind of caught on with, um, you know, we didn't have the social media at the time that we have now, but the public got involved and there was some actually some PR. There was a guy who decided that he was gonna make his name out of making a big stink about Coke and he was a PR guy. And so he just went on his own on this campaign against Coke, Coca-Cola against New Coke, made a huge stink about it and they got everybody fired up. Pepsi is going, yeah, go for it, fight it out. And so Pepsi had, you know, was gaining market share they're gaining market share. And to, to understand market share, that means that, let's say there's one million people who drink soda, and you know if you have half of the market, you've got half the people drinking your product. 
if you got 75% of the market, 75% of the people are drinking your product. It's a fixed market. That's the market. That's the people who buy it. So New Coke tanked so bad that finally, you know, these are publicly traded companies. The investors are like, this is enough. We're losing market share, which means we're, our stock price is plummeting, which means our, the, the value of our company is going down. So stop it. So finally, Coke said, oh, okay, we were wrong. And they then launched classic Coke. They brought out the old formula and they said, okay, we were wrong. The original is better. Here, you can have classic Coke back. And then if you're old enough, you remember that for a while they actually marketed it as Coca-Cola classic. And then they finally took that off of the, uh, they took that off of the branding. It is interesting to me that the, the decision to change the formula was made after they found that people liked the sweeter stuff. So they changed it. But the original was the best. Sometimes the original shouldn't be messed with. Don't mess with classic Coke. Don't mess with my plain old Triscuits. I just want them plain. Come on. And let me tell you about something else that has stood the test of time. Through many attempts to change the formula and sweeten it up. This is the message that's continued for 2,000 years. This is the message of the OG, the original gospel. The original. Because he loved us, God sent his own son to walk among us. He came to deliver us and to give us a new covenant between God and man. He died for our sins. He set mankind free from a religious system. He offers salvation to a sinful world. And he offered us salvation to all mankind, not just to one group. And Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were all part of the OG, the original gospel message. And this original gospel message changed the world. It changed the way we keep track of time. What year is it? What year is it? 2023 what? AD. They still keep trying to say, oh, uh, Christian era. Yeah, well, you're still, look, look, because it's AD, what does that stand for? And what does that mean? The year of our Lord. So secularists say, well, ugh. okay, BC, before Christ. No, we don't like that. We've got to say before Christian era. Sorry, you're still saying, you know, Christian. Sorry. He still changed the world. The original gospel message still changed the world. Uh, we don't care if you want to try to change AD to, you know, Christian era. You're still, you're still saying Christian. And uh, call it something else. We're still counting down. You want to stop counting? We want to say, no, no, no. We don't like this so much that we need to like start counting into different. No more 2023. It's uh, 4975 now. Sorry, you can't do it. We're locked in. We're locked in. Even the non-Christian nations now keep a track by the same calendars that we are because Christ rules. Sorry about that. We got the calendar. So it was almost immediately with the, with, the, uh, with the advent of the OG, the original gospel, people try, start trying to change the formula. Change it. I mean, this started right away. This started still in the Bible. We got the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans perverted the message of grace. Anything goes. We read about the Nicolaitans in Revelation 2, 6. 
historian Clement of Alexandria talks about the Nicolaitans. He says, they abandoned themselves to pleasure, leading a life of self-indulgence. On the other end of the spectrum, still within the time of Scripture, we've got the Galatians. This was a group of Jewish Christians. They were teaching that the basis for salvation was still following the law and the Jewish customs. So these was, Jesus had died to set us free, and the Galatians said, well, don't be too free, okay? You need to come under here and, and, uh, and come, up, come under this Jewish law, even if you're not Jewish. And Paul addressed this problem in the book of Galatians. This is what Paul said. We are justified by faith. Anyone can have faith. Therefore, anyone can be a part of God's family. You're justified by faith. There's nothing that you can do, no rules that you can follow to make you more justifieder. You just need to be justified, just if fied. Okay? That's it. Paul says, we have freedom. Christ fulfilled the law. He didn't do away with it. He fulfilled the law. And he suffered the curse of the law in our, pra in our place. Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Free from the law and freedom from sin. If we repent, we are forgiven and we are free. We can drop it. When we drop the rope, boom. Boom. And, Paul said, we are equal. We are equal. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Your race, your gender, your past cannot keep you from the fellowship. Come on now. It can't keep you out. It can't keep you down. God's love and salvation is for everybody. Say it with me, everybody. Everybody. I left out the V and the E, you know, it's gangster style. Everybody. Paul brought them back to the original gospel. He said, this is the message of the OG. It's freedom. Don't let these guys bewitch you. Don't listen to them. Man, if somebody comes in and starts telling you, yeah, what you're doing is pretty good, but you need to do, you got to do this stuff too. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to go to church on, on this day. You're not doing that. Um, you got to, you, you're, I, I don't think, how much are you praying? Oh, an hour a day? That's, you don't need to ramp it up. You're going to need like two hours a day. How often are you reading your Bible? four hours a week, you're going to need like 10. <laughs> if, if anybody says, starts talking to you like that, you tell them, get behind me, Satan, because that's Satan talking to you. Should we pray a lot and read our Bible? Yes. But, but how should the intent, the, the desire should come from God? Like I, want, I want so much of God that I just want to keep reading his word. And I, I want to I, I spend time in worship to him. I want to spend time praying to him. I want to spend time talking about him. Because I want to. Because he put the desire in me. Over the centuries, attempts were made to change the formula. To change the OG. The Gnostics. These guys came in around A.D. 140, Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic. Around A.D. 140, so only 140 years approximately after the birth of Christ, a guy named Valentinus 
Valentinus. You've heard of Valentines. Comes from this guy. Valentinus began teaching Gnostic views in Rome. So Rome had become the kind of headquarters of the church at the time. The Gnostic heresy is from the Greek word gnost, gnosis, meaning knowledge. Gnostic. This is the belief that there are sec that there's a secret or mysterious knowledge reserved for those with true understanding, which leads to salvation of the soul. This includes a belief that the human spirit is basically good. Listen to me. This teaches that the human spirit is born basically good. Does that align with scripture's teaching? No, it does not. This is Gnostic teaching, that we were born basically good, but we're trapped in a human fleshy body, which is evil, or is just an illusion. Your body is just an illusion. The Gnostics taught that Jesus was a spiritual being, but he only seemed to be human. The Gnostics de denied the physical resurrection of Jesus, in other words, they were heretics. This is the definition of heresy. But it crept in. Next, we have the, the Pelagianists, Pelagianism. Now, I'm skipping a lot, okay? Because there, if you, if you start researching heresies, you need a long scroll. Maybe one that's as long as this. You could scroll it out as long as this room. And you're still not going to have them all. Because some of the guys didn't get famous and popular enough to write it down. Pelagianism. In the late 300s, I'm just highlighting a few, a monk named Pelagius, he began teaching that there's no such thing as original sin in Adam. But that God created us basically good. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like the Gnostic we were created basically good. There's no such thing as original sin. And Pelagianism teaches that if you are not living a holy life, it's because you were not trying hard enough. Does that sound fun? I have actually heard Pelagian heresy taught from the pulpit of a very popular Pentecostal church. This was the statement that I heard. We need to stop coming from the premise that people are created evil. We need to start with the premise that people are created basically good. Okay? That sounds nice, and that may draw people to your church, but that is, my friends, is heresy. And it's actually called Pelagianism. This is what happens when teachers go start to, 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 to say, okay, I need something better. I've got to flavor this, this, this message up. This old G is, is stale. They want something sweeter, so I'm going to go off the map. This is what you get. And also when you don't, take a look at history. Because remember... What the writer of Ecclesiastes said, there's nothing new under the sun. When you hear a new heresy, it ain't new, friends. It's O-H, old heresy. <laughs> oh, snap. Okay. This teaching, Pelagianism, it contradicts the scripture. In including, how can you tell if a teaching is wrong? Because it contradicts the, the scripture. And not just one verse of the scripture. Contradicts the scripture, including Romans 5, which tells us, through the disobedience of the one, many, many were made sinners. And Psalm 51, 5, which tells us that we were sinful from the moment of conception. We were born in sin. Does that sound terrible? It kind of does sound terrible. It's supposed to sound terrible because we don't have to stay in sin. We have a Savior 
And he died so that he could say, would you like salvation? Would you like to be pulled out of the disgusting pit that you are in? Would you like freedom? And we could say, yes, I want freedom. I want salvation. And he says, okay, it's free. That's it. You get it. That's the OG. Psalm 51.5. This teaching, the Pelagianism, relies on human freedom and willpower instead of the grace of God. In fact, with Pelagianism, we don't even need God's grace because we got our own. We can just do it by ourselves. Uh, friends, this teaching is, is becoming more prominent in modern churches today. The, the teaching that you, you have great power. And maybe we're getting closer and closer to maybe you got the power of God, the same, like we don't. Our God, do you know what he did? He existed from before time began. Do you know what else he did? He spoke and the world was created. He's intense and immense and unfathomable. And we are humans. Created beings. Created in his image. But we are created by a creator who existed from before time began. We don't need to try to be like him. No, no, no. I, I, don't, want, I don't want that. Could you imagine if you truly had this type of power? Uh-oh. Well, because that means if you do, other people do too, right? No bueno. No. So over time, many more heresies would creep in, and including from those that would believe that they had a new revelation. So this would happen. You have some time go by. Somebody say, I got a new one. I got a new revelation. Y'all, this is, this is good. This is really going to sweeten up the, the gospel. Like, listen, check this out. After, in 400 AD, after centuries of persecution against Christians, Emperor Constantine, a Roman emperor, ruler of the known world, outlawed paganism and began to accept Christianity. He was baptized just prior to his death. Now, that, that sounds wonderful, right? Well, it's not so wonderful when the head of, a, of the power of Rome accepts, he, he goes into Christianity, but he makes it a part of the government. He liked it because he saw power in it. One of the things that I read said this emperor, he, he won a, a battle because, I don't know, they were carrying, you know, a, a flag of, uh, a Christian flag or something like that. And so he was like, oh, yeah, okay, I want this. But he also saw the power that he could get in controlling people through this religion. That's not new, but, boy, it's held on forever. If you got a group of people that believes something with all their hearts and mind, and you actually could control their salvation, you could you could be the ones that could say, "This is what this is what became of that of that Roman church," where they could say, "Listen, uh, if you don't do this, you're not going to heaven. Like I'm sorry, but you're out. We we decide, we decide. So." Oh, you, you did sin? Well, we can give you forgiveness, but it's, it's going to cost you. Give, give me some money. Uh, how, how much? You know, 20 bucks? We go to heaven? 20? Okay. Oh, that's dangerous. What, you know what that tells me? When you see a system like that, the believers are the ones who are getting beat up. Do you think the ones at the top believe? I, I just don't think so. Because if they, if they do, they've got to ignore big parts of the Bible. Mainly, the one that scares me is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You want to fool around? You want to pretend that you got the power of God? 
You want to pretend that you're doing things because God told you to do them? And, and that's not the truth? Prepare to die. That scares me. Or you don't believe it. Now the power of government began to corrupt the OG, the gospel message. All across time, there were those who would continue to attempt to change the recipe of the original gospel. Add a little something. Now this is amazing. That through all of this time, over 2,000 years, the core of the original gospel message has survived. We still know what it is. And those of us who yearn for truth, we will find it. Because it's simple. It's not complicated. If it starts looking complicated, something is wrong. Through all of this, there's been, there's always a remnant. There's always a remnant that hangs on to the OG. They see through the sparkles and the flash and the smoke and the pomp and circumstance. And they say, no, this is not the original gospel message. It's much more simple than that. Just as God told Elijah, when Elijah is standing in a cave, and he says, Lord, I'm all alone. I'm the only one alive who still loves you and still stands by your you know, precepts. I'm Here I am, and I'm, and I'm depressed, and I can't do it. Just go ahead and kill me. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry, God. You're... Yeah, everything fell apart because, you know, you put it all on me, and I'm just carrying this, and I'm the man, and I just, I can't do it anymore. And then God's just like, dude. Sorry, that's, I'm trying to talk gangster talk. I think they say dude. Do they say dude, Hobby? Bro. Bro. Homie. <laughs> I got 7,000 guys you don't even know about. They have never bowed to idols. They're my reserves. This, it, it, this is deep to me because, like, we, we think, we have a tendency to think like we can know it all. Well, we absolutely cannot know it all. And, and God gives us certain pieces. He might give a piece to you, and he gave a piece of knowledge to you, and you have some knowledge, and you have a gift, and you have a gift, and you have this, and you have this. But God, God knows it all and is working it all for his glory, for his favor. We don't get to see the big picture. And Elijah didn't get to see that. God always protects and keeps a reserve that's faithful to his word. It's part of probably God's strategy with the devil. There is a war that is going on 24 hours a day. In fact, Ethan and I were discussing time from a, from a heavenly perspective. Time in heaven doesn't work the way that we do. Maybe there's even more than 24. Maybe there's 24,000 hours a day in heaven. Who knows? We don't understand how heaven works. But there is a constant battle going on. God's in charge and God's winning. But there are times Satan still thinks he's got a chance. You don't. But he's not going to give up yet. But he doesn't get to know where the reserves are all the time. He doesn't get to know that as, you know, these different groups, there's, if you read about them, there's the Waldensians, and there's these group over here, and there's Martin Luther, and there's these different people. Sometimes they're part of the system. And God begins to speak to them and say, listen to me. There's something wrong. Read my word. This doesn't, this is not right. Have you ever heard a message and you would say, this is not right. This is not right. I don't even understand why it's not right. 
This is God whispering to you for the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called discernment. And then you go back and you look in your book. You look in your book and you say, well, that's why. Because it's, it's, not, it's not in here. <laughs> it's twisted. Lord, protect us, God. Give us all this discernment to know and to be able to discern when we hear the wrong, Lord God, and be able to understand and know when we see the truth. Father, thank you. Today, we still have those that want to sweeten the message of the OG. Sweeten it up. I'm going to go through just a few of these real quick. Again, we would need a scroll the size of this room to, to cover them all, so I've kind of lumped them. We got many examples of the new and improved gospel flavor, okay? Well, I'm going to give you just a few. One, we got Church of the Get That Money. Everybody say, Get That Money. Get that money. Some of them even got names that have money in them. I should change my name to Abe Money. <laughs> then I could be a famous preacher. Money. The church of the get that money, that's what we also call the prosperity gospel. It says, God wants you to have like loads of money, like in wheelbarrows, loads of money. Come on, get some. God really exists to serve you, get you something. Now, God's desire is for our needs to be met. And if your needs are for giant wheelbarrows of money, then I guess God's going to get you what you need. Maybe that's what I need to do. I need to realize I need wheelbarrows full of money, but I don't. <laughs> I don't. One wheelbarrow would be fine. I'm just saying. But if we're following a religion, a system, so we can get something, we got it wrong. Because in our religion, what we're doing is we're following something so we can give something because we already got something for free. We got salvation. You know what else we got? Eternity. Eternity, which we can't comprehend. Here's what the word says about the church of the get that money. Timothy 6, 8 through 10. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, shall we be content? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and the snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money's not evil. The love of money is evil. It's the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from their faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with sorrows. Satan tempted Jesus with riches of the world when he went into the wilderness. And Jesus said, away with you, it is written, you shall serve the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The OG message is this, God will supply all your needs. We serve him, a great God. And we serve him in advancing the kingdom and in spreading the good news of the OG. We don't need to worry about getting bank. If you want bank, work hard for it. It's okay. I'm not saying God, God said, oh, you, you need to be poor. That's, that's not it. It's just, that's not the way it works. This is not the message of the OG. Here's another one. It's the church of the anything goes. It says, hey, man, it's 2023, man. Let's be hip and cool. I don't know if I'm talking the right lingo, but I'm trying to. I want to be hip with the hipsters. The Bible is really old, and it's not cool, and it's not relevant to today's society, and it's not relevant to our culture. So, you know, we can rip some pages out, or we can just kind of not talk about it a whole lot. And we'll get together, and we'll sing some songs, and we're going to feel good. When you leave, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that was awesome. That was really cool. I really like going there because I just feel so good. I just feel really good. Now, I'm not going to go down on a, on a bash right here, but there, there's an interesting documentary right now that's, cut, that's out about Hillsong. And what's interesting to me is the interviews with the people who would go to the church in New York. And they would say, man, I love to go in there because I'd go and I'd just feel so good. And they would line up around the block. And they would wait like at a nightclub for hours to get in to the Hillsong New York. Because it was awesome. They just, oh, so cool. The music was awesome. 
It was so cruel. And then I, and then I would go home. It was like, were you, were you changed? Were you changed forever by the message of the gospel? In most cases, unfortunately and sadly, I don't think that they were. Because when New York Hillsong imploded, so did their faith. Most of the young people that they talk to don't have anything to do with church anymore. But they sure thought that this place was cool. And that guy was really cool with his skinny jeans. It was awesome. Okay, God's awesome. Yes. And we can, and we can do a wonderful job with, our, with presenting worship and all of these kinds of things. But this is not why we go here. This is serious business. We're here to worship our creator, God. And if all we have for a sound system is a bucket, then we're going to sing into the bucket. And we're going to praise God. And the bucket will be our amplifier and our drum and our guitar. We'll put a little, you know, one of those gut strings on it and do it old style like they do down in the south. The author of the original gospel, this is what 2 Corinthians 6.17 6, says. Therefore, come out from among them. And be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. I will receive you. The author of the OG calls us to come out of the world. Come out. We will be a light to the world. Did you know that if we just preach the gospel, people will come to hear the gospel? The original gospel message. Yes, we can entertain people, but you can go to a concert and get entertained. You can go pay 20 bucks to get into the movie theater and get entertained. You can turn on your TV and get entertained. You can do anything you want to be entertained. We're not here to be entertained. We're here to worship the creator, to grow in love of our creator, to be enabled and encouraged to spread the gospel message of our creator to those around us. We need to just have courage to do it. Preach it. Preach the gospel. We don't need to sweeten it. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine among all men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Hallelujah. And we got the church of the walking dead. Here we see the saints going mournfully through the motions. This is the church of Sardis, referred to in Revelation 3.2. I know your deeds, Jesus says to the church of Sardis. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. This is the church that is spiritually dead. The joy of the Lord has been lost. What does the word say? Be of good cheer. Be joyful. Give thanks, for he has overcome the world. We got tons to be joyful for. Woo! We do. We should be the shoutingest, happiest people you've ever seen. When we give praise to our God, think about what they would do. In the, in the Old Testament, we see times when they would come through the sea. They walked through water that was piled up on both sides, and they were saved, and an army was after them. And what did they do? They gave great glory to God. Yes, you are our God. And then they passed down to generations. Children, let me tell you the story about what happened to Grandma and Grandpa when they came across. You already told us a story, Grandpa. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you again because we're never going to forget this, what God did to us. And finally, the last church I'm going to touch on here, I call it the Church of the New Age. This church says, hey, if we want to pursue God, we got to go off the map. Translation, we need to set aside all this moldy old Bible stuff and just go after God. Our leaders are the new apostles, and they have been given new revelations. Follow these men and women without question. Do not question how far they stray from the word. You don't want to be a Pharisee after all. The New Age Church says, we need to take back the things that the New Age religion has stolen from us. Mysticism, that's ours. 
Teleportation, that's ours. Angel worship, that's ours. Christian tarot cards, that's ours. This is what the New Age Church says. This teaches that we are basically equals to we are basically equal to God. And we see variations of this teaching, but at the core, this is a New Age teaching. We're little gods. New Age teaching elevates man while diminishing the power of God. One of the more prominent teachings that can be heard from multiple pulpits and social media postings of prominent ministries today is the concept that we are co-creators with God. We hear this, it sounds good, but look into it a little deeper. This is a concept that has connections with theistic evolution, transhumanism, neo-Marxism, New Ageism, and the prosperity gospel. The concept, this concept, the co-creator concept claims that as creative beings fashioned in our creator's image, humans are meant to join in assisting God in further creating reality. We are equal to God in our creative power. This concept was Oh, you all think I'm making it up? No, no. Our research. <laughs> Let me tell you. This concept was introduced by a Lutheran theologian. His name's Philip Hefner. And he wrote a book in 1993 called The Human Factor. So Hefner believes in evolution. He's a theologian. He believes in evolution. And he teaches that God used evolution to create humans as beings who have the power to further create reality. Liberating the process of evolution towards God's ends becomes the God-given destiny of human beings. This is from his book. Hefner did not start with the premise that God's word is supreme. He says, the program accepts that theology as explanation is dead unless it learns to integrate itself within elements of scientific understanding that undergird explanation from our time in history. So he's starting from the premise, science, we got to fit God into it. Shoop. We must accept the premises that science states as uh, theories, evolution, and, and other scientific theory. The theory is a theory, by the way. And then we need to take God and say, well, how does God fit? It's the it's the backwards way to do this, okay? The concept of humans as co-creators with God has become very popular in very diverse circles. The Pope has even uh, made a statement uh, in favor of this concept. Pierre de Hard de Chardin, I'm not French, but you could pretend I am, a Jesuit priest who is instrumental in developing the New Age moment taught that evolution would bring humanity to an omega point. Have you heard this term transhumanism? This, is, this has to do with this. The New Age moment, evolution would bring humanity to an omega point where we would achieve, we, you and I, would achieve godlike consciousness. That doesn't sound like the OG. There's something wrong there. That sounds kind of rotten. New Age teaches that there is a Christ spirit. Terminology is important. They teach, yeah, I believe in, in Christ. If you're talking to somebody who's, who's New Age, you might not know, realize that as you're talking, when they'll say, yeah, I believe in, I believe in Christ too. You'll be like, oh, really? That's, that surprises me. Oh, yeah, yeah, Christ Spirit. I believe in Christ Spirit. Okay, Christ Spirit is not Christ. This is a New Age belief. We believe in Christ Spirit, which is a divine spirit that is available to all, everybody. A Franciscan friar, Richard Rohr, is the author of The Universal Christ, and he's been very influential in modern Christianity. He's influential to the ex-pastor Rob Bell. You may have heard of Rob Bell. He's an influential Christian. Um, evangelical Christian, and he decided, well, hell's not real, and, uh, well, 
I'm not a Christian. And then uh, you shouldn't be either. Uh, he was influenced by these teachings. Uh, Richard Rohr is, is an Oprah Winfrey interviewee. Uh, he's described as a modern Christian mystic. Rohr is one of the forces behind the rise of the Enneagram within Christian circles. He's the author of The Enneagram. He teaches that Jesus and Christ were not necessarily the same person. According to Rohr, Jesus' death on the cross did not accomplish redemption. Instead, I am Jesus. You are Jesus. Everybody's Jesus. We're all Jesus. Jesus is just like life spirit, man. And Jesus is not the same thing as Christ. The crucifixion, according to Richard Rohr, is just a symbolic letting go of ego so we can be re reborn, resurrected. To quote Richard Rohr, if a video camera had been placed in front of the tomb of Jesus, it wouldn't have filmed a lone man emerging from a grave, but something like beams of light extending in all directions. Is that the gospel? That's not the OG. Jesus is God, fully God, fully man. Jesus came to earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, sacrificed on a cross, died for our sins, died a horrible death, was put into a grave, and physically rose. Thomas put his fingers into his hands. Mary saw him in the garden. He walked with people. He taught them. He told them who he was. He told us what's going to happen now. And then he ascended back to the right hand of God. He's the only one who has ever done this. Jesus is the heart and the center of the OG. I don't want the new thing. I don't want new gospel. I want the OG. I want the original gospel. I don't want the spicy one. I don't want the olive oil with salt one. I don't want the queso flavored. I don't want the Diablo, the hot Cheeto flavored. Ugh. <laughs> that stuff's gross. And it's probably not good for you. But the gospel is incredibly good for you. I want more of the gospel. Fill me up with the gospel, Lord. Fill us all up with the gospel, Lord. Let us overflow with the gospel. Let us understand what it is. Unlike the formula of Coca-Cola, the formula of the gospel ain't no secret. It's not a secret. In fact, we're supposed to blab it to everybody. There's nobody saying, oh, don't, don't, no, 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 don't, don't tell them too much because then, you know, then they'll have it. And then you just go give it to somebody else. You got to keep some of that. No, that's not the gospel. Do you want to know the ingredients? Let's, let's expose the secret ingredients of the OG once and for all. Are you ready? Real quick. We're going to have four, four ingredients of the gospel. Number one, we were born into a sinful world, and we're all stained by sin. Delicious. That's Romans 3.23. For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We pour some of that in there. All right, number two, we're going to put a cup of this in there. Jesus Christ died for our sins, your sins, any sins, my sins. He is both God and man. His death paid the debt of our sin. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We'll put some of that in there. All right. Then we're going to do half a cup of this. So I'm just going to do a full cup of this one. Number three, secret ingredient number three, Jesus rose again. He conquered death. He got the victory over death. Revelation 1.8, 
I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. He's got the keys. Death has no meaning anymore. And finally, the final fourth secret ingredient. We're going to put a cup of this in here too. Christ offers his salvation as a free gift to you and to me. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Look at this again. We see this one all the time. For the what? For the what? The wages of sin. For the wages of sin. How do you get wages? How do you get wages? You work for it. Go punch the time clock. I did my eight hours. Now give me my money. The wages of sin. But the what? But the what? The wages. Oh, I, th I pointed to the back wall. I thought there was something up there. <laughs> okay, the wages of sin is death. But the what? Okay, this makes more sense when I got something to point at. <laughs> you guys just like, stop pointing at the wall. You're crazy. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is free. You work for the wages. The gift, it's given to you, hobby. It's given to you. Take it. It's free. Yes. Hallelujah. Woo. Oh, boy. I love it. I love it. That's okay. I want the gift. How do I get it? Well, you put $10 on the back of a thing and you spill out. No, you don't. This gift it's like free water. You just, you just open it up and drink it. It's about that simple. I, well, let me tell you how you get there. There's something you got to do. There's, there's, there's always a catch, right? Well, you got to be ready to give up your life. Jesus said, count the cost. Okay, this is, there's a cost to following Christ. But there's much greater benefit. So be ready to, to pay the price. But, but, but here, here it is. The, the price is free, but it's your life. Here's how you get it. Free gift of salvation. The instructions are actually here in the word. Romans 10, 9. This is how you do it. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord... And you believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's it. That's the OG. That's the message of the OG. Stand to your feet. This is the OG. We're going to do this. If you've done it already, awesome. Let's do it again. All right? Say, I declare Jesus is Lord. Let's do that again. I declare. Jesus is Lord, and I believe with my whole heart that God raised him from the dead. And now I get salvation. That's it. Say, I am saved. Hallelujah. I am saved. Hallelujah. I am saved. Hallelujah. It's the OG. We did it. We got through it. Now we have it. Now we got to go give everybody else some of that good OG. Okay? So let's do it. Thank you, God, for this fantastic day, Lord. We love you, God, as we go forth from here. Just fill us with, with power, Lord God. Fill us with joy. Fill us with love for you, Lord God, and for your people. Give us opportunities this week to meet others and to share the simple message of the gospel with them, Lord. Thank you for making it so simple. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.